their world, but their presence is no more scientific than somebody being at your back door. Is somebody back there or not? Well, you go look, right? Or you have a camera pointed at your back step, whatever. We're, the, the idea that they're here or not is simply a forensic fact, and that has been proven by a mass of evidence, the totality of which is absolutely beyond a reasonable doubt. So there's ETs here. We know it, and we know the government know it. And I'll go further. People in government have confirmed this to me. People inside government have confirmed it to Dr. Edgar Mitchell and other colleagues of mine. So, you know, I, I really I don't – so the citing issue, you know, Stevensville is fascinating, but it's just one more citing amongst tens of thousands. Yeah, you know, even right. when I had Jacques Vallée on just before you came on, I mean, there's no doubt with this person, this person who we both have tremendous respect for, hmm. something's going on. Sure. And we just can't put the finger on it, though we've tried – we don't get any help from science or government. Well, no, no, they're not. They, but they know. I mean, they've done plenty of science, and they've had tons of money to do it with. But that science is not available to us. Uh, so this, 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 this distinction, this break between, quote, the science that was being done in one form or another from 47 right on up and still going on, and the politics, this break is where exopolitics comes in. And the, the creation of that term was to sort of define that break and to, 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 to have a term that would then embrace where we're really going now, where, where this thing has to go, which is to, to change government policy. And that's why we needed that term, so we could start thinking in those terms uh, and thinking a political way about this issue. Now, for those who can't accept the ET hypothesis, that for whatever reason, they just, they, what, they've looked at all the evidence, they go, ah, I just don't think I'm sure that ETs are here. I understand that they might be uh, a little askance, look askance at this uh, the actual political and, and the disclosure process. But I think their, their, their numbers are, are, are diminishing, and the number of people that are saying, yeah, sure, there's an ET presence. It still seems to me that uh, other countries, though, seem a little more accessible to releasing UFO stories and information. Oh, yeah. Uh, is we, and this is one of the many things that are happening in the last couple of years. Other countries are taking definitive actions, and it's all it's all preliminary. It's all part of a a process underway with them. Uh, France and and UK particularly have been very aggressive. They're releasing thousands of files and documents and classified UFO sighting reports. They're putting it out there. Basically, they're sort of cleaning house. Why are they doing that? Well. You could ask them. They probably would not say. I'll tell you why they're doing it, right? It's a very, very, it's a strong uh, guess based on many years of looking at this. They are preparing for what's coming, and what's coming is disclosure. And they want that stuff out there. They're sort of leading the way in a way. They're putting it out there. It puts them in a good position. The United States hasn't made this move yet. But as you know, John Podesta, a leading figure in the Democratic Party, has called for it. And Bill Richardson, a leading figure in the Democratic Party, has called for it. And Bill Clinton entertained a two-year effort by Lawrence Rockefeller from 93 to 95 while he was – I'm sorry, 93 to 96 – while he was president, who was calling for it. And so it, 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 there's, 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 there's no mystery here. The major governments are, are, are sort of know that the jig is up. They sort of know that the, the, the embargo lasted 60 years. It was well-crafted. It was quite a party, and, uh, and they're all very pleased with themselves. And they did a great job, I admit. They did but, do a good job. Yeah, no, it's this. unbelievable. Uh, it's the best propaganda job ever in history, uh, most effective, G given the circumstances that they did it in. It wasn't, we don't have a totalitarian state here. There aren't stormtroopers marching up and down the streets. You know? they, they were able to pull the wool over the eyes of all the institutions. And the, the press and, and and get them to go along with this uh, for all of this time, and 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 overall the thing is still not quote over the paradigm line, but it's it's over. I mean it, it's falling apart everywhere. I mean I could spend five hours tonight, Joe, uh, <laughs> Joe, uh, George, telling you <laughs> the, wh where it's all falling apart, and and and. Uh, uh, but your 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 listeners need to know this: that the truth embargo is literally collapsing. Everywhere, it just had it, the dam. In other words, it got cracks in it, all all up and down. But you just haven't had the one breakout. Expect it soon. And 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 if the United States doesn't finally follow suit, one of these countries is going to do this. One of these countries is going to do a disclosure event. It'll either be France or England or very possibly China, uh, where there's a lot of research going on. It's encouraged by the government. They have no problem with it. Uh, they have their own space program, and they're starting to assert themselves as a major world power. Give right? me a synopsis. 
hypothetically, of yeah. how the disclosure from another country, let's say, would come, and what would they say? How would they announce this? Basically, it would be a uh, it would it would come from the the high, the, 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 the premier president. Uh, party chairman, whatever, indicating that uh, they're going to make a major announcement. They would then hold a press conference, just like we do here, and they bring out their military people and a lot of other people, and they would say, uh, the government of France, uh, today, we used to tell citizens of France, as well as the, uh, the rest of the world, that yes, indeed, as many suspected, there is an extraterrestrial presence, right? And then they would start showing a lot of gun camera footage from their chase planes, right? Mm-hmm. One of the things that people probably don't think about much, is that we've been chasing these things and sending up planes for 60 years. And some have been knocked down, planes, of our planes. Perhaps in the early days, there's all speculation that we shot some of them down, and they started shooting some of us down, and then we stopped that right away. But the point is that these planes all had cameras in them. You don't send up these chase planes. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't send up these defensive planes that are essentially supporting the perimeter of your countries without cameras. You must record everything that goes on. And so when they send these things up, they've got gun camera footage that's never been revealed. None of these countries allow this out because if you could FOI gun camera footage, this would, this whole thing would have been over a long time ago. So they just bring out the gun camera footage. You see enough, you know, shots from these planes or these craft that they're approaching and then zipping off. We've had plenty of pilots see these things outside their uh, their their. Uh, um, well, look at the two cockpit. the two pilots over Britain uh, months ago. The who, Guernsey side, yeah, they, who's the, the you know a mile size? On, now, even if they were wrong a little bit by the size of this thing, this is huge. And then, of course, you had the, what, what appeared to be a large craft over Stephenville. Uh, I think it's the same craft, by the way. It, yeah, could be. But I tell you something else that intrigues me. Let's talk about Stephenville again. Look, one of the things that's been going on since '91, which is when the era of exopolitics began when the witnesses started coming forward and the political resolution really started to become possible because enough people were breaking ranks inside a government that we could finally crack it open, get in there, and, and get a policy change. It's the huge flap in Mexico that, that essentially has made Jaime Massan. and he's now become literally the – he will be. Jaime Massan is going to be a star, a, a major figure in, in the future, very near future, as the principal spokeswoman per, person for all of Latin America, which means Central Mexico, Central America, and South America. We're it, talking about... Is he going to make the conference, by the way? Uh, not chance? this year. Not, not this, this year. year. Okay. Um, uh, but he has been at two, two of them, uh, which is, what, 800 million people. Th- this flap has been going on in Mexico for a very long time, and I always viewed that what was going on there is the ETs were basically using Mexico as a way to kind of stick a sharp stick in the underbelly of the United States, to prod it, right, to push it from below, generating a lot of interest in the second world country just to the south of us without putting too much pressure on us for whatever reason. This is just a speculation. But I can assure you, if the same kinds of sightings have been going on every 10 years were going on up here, we would definitely be further along. They didn't do it. However, recently, they seem to be crossing the border. So you've got the you've got the sighting in Stevensville, Texas. You've got the sighting just across the border in in, in, in Mexico. It's kind of like they're coming north, like the killer bees. Now, if this is a pattern, we're going to see more of this, which means the pressure from upstairs to drive the terrestrial process towards resolution, towards self awareness, and all that is intensifying. But there are sightings elsewhere, like the Guernsey sighting. Look, how many mile wide craft, how many saucers off the cockpits of airplanes? Are we going to eventually report, right, either on Larry King or wherever else we can get before, you know, again, the thing just becomes so ridiculous. I mean, it's just so insane, George, that, that a government as advanced as our republic, with the science we have and, and the commitment we have to free speech, everything else that we're trying to do in the 21st century, what the Catholic Church tried to do in the time of Galileo, which is to say, look, we just don't want the world to know about this Earth going around the sun thing, and so we're going to suppress it for a while. And, you know, at that time, it was a little easier to suppress things. You didn't have a highly literate public, and there was no Internet, I don't think there was. Uh, and so they sort of did for a while, but eventually, it was, yeah, sure, everybody figured it out, yeah, just like they figured out the world was round. And yet in the 21st century, they're trying to do this again. They're trying to say to the world, all six billion people, hey, and you know, there's nothing here there. Yeah, nothing to see. Move along. It's okay. Look. And they do it with this wonderful uh, embargo disinformation scheme where they base the whole thing on a non-denial denial, which I, I love. It's just so brilliant. 
the position, as you know, well know, George, since 1969, since the closing of Blue Book, you, you approach any agency, you get a standard response back, whether it's from the Air Force or the Army or from the NASA. It's two things. One, thank you for contacting us. We no longer investigate this phenomena, and whatever this phenomena is, it does impose the national security threat. They never say that there's no ETs here. In fact, you can never get anybody in government to say there's no ETs here because, you see, that would be awkward since at any moment any number of countries could say, oh, yes, there are, and here's the footage to prove it. And so they, they build the whole thing on a non-denial denial. They then factor in a whole don't ask, don't tell policy, right, which is becoming very epidemic in our government, meaning you know, don't ask, don't tell is sort of turning up all over the place. Very bad way to run a railroad, in my opinion. And they've managed to hold this thing together. But as you and I know, every day fewer people believe this nonsense. Stephen, when we come back, I, I want to talk about uh, Bill Clinton. He has said some things about Roswell. We had a little clip of that last week. Uh, of course, the UFO question came up in uh, presidential debates with yes, Dennis indeed. Kucinich, Bill Richardson. I want to get your take on that as well. Next hour, we'll uh, also open up uh, the phone lines. Also want to get your take on the National Press Club's presentation of uh, you and Jim Fox and others for the Coalition of Freedom of Information and how that seems to be going. So stick with us. Stephen Bassett, our guest, and of course, we're going to tell you about the X Conference 2008. I will be there this time. It'll be first time for me to be there. Um, most of the time, all my conferences seem to be on the West Coast. This is an East Coast one, so I'm looking forward to that. So those of you in the greater Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area, Boston, Philadelphia, you want to just storm the place, I'll be there. I'd love to meet you. Uh, we'll talk about that, too, when I come back. Tomorrow night, researcher and author Christian Wilde joins us as we talk about the incredible breakthroughs in heart research, heart stem cell work as well. And I will also be posting on the coasttocoastdm.com website tomorrow night. Finally, the long-awaited regimen that I've been using for keeping your arteries cleaned out and everything else. We're going to post all the supplements and ingredients that I've been using over all these years. So you can uh, do your own homework uh, in, um, you know what, if you're going to make any changes to yourself, of course, I recommend you talk to your doctor, but we're going to put it up on the website, what I do. I'll be back in a moment with Stephen Bassett on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Stephen, um, Big D and Bubba show that we syndicate. Uh, they're in about 50 markets out of Nashville. Mm -hmm. They had a chance to talk with Bill Clinton uh, this is last week or so, and uh, the UFOs came up. I want you to hear the clip with me and uh, just get your reaction to it, okay? Oh, yeah. Here we go. Before we go, uh, Bubba, you know, from one Bubba to another, Bubba here has wanted to ask the president something for how many years now? But now here he is. President Clinton is on the phone with you, Bubba. Ask your, your question. Now, you're going to probably think I'm the biggest dork on the planet, but when will we, if we will ever know, the truth about UFOs? Well, I tell you, it's interesting that you said that because when we um, celebrated the anniversary of that event out in New Mexico, you remember that? Right, yes. yeah. Uh, I actually got all the government documents and read them, and I'm convinced there wasn't a UFO there. On the other hand, you shouldn't give up hope because just a couple months ago, our uh, government physicist, uh, I mean astrophysicist, spotted a planet revolving around a star that's one of the closest to, to our solar system that they believe has conditions uh, close enough to Earth that it might contain life. Unfortunately, it's 20 million light years away, so unless you, your kids, and your grandkids, and maybe one more generation are willing to take a trip for us, <laughs> we'll have to wait for them to come to us. And then we'll know the truth. Well, I'm happy. At least I got to ask my question, the dumbest question in the whole wide world no, to no, ask no. any that president. Rockwell thing, that Rockwell thing is incited the interest of a lot of people. So when we had the anniversary of it, I actually, I think it was 98, I actually went back and read the documents from the government. I'm convinced that uh, that, that wasn't a UFO, but who knows? You won't get that kind of question on CNN or Fox. <laughs> no, I won't. Only with Big I Although I think, didn't one of the candidates, I think in one of the debates, got asked if he believed there was life in outer space. Well, of course, you'll also get it here on Coast to Coast. He kept saying Rockwell instead of Roswell. Hmm. Uh, George, there's a lot of background to that. Let me, uh, let me uh, clue, clue your listeners in. Um, for the last year, easily a year, maybe longer, the number one, priority project for Paradigm Research Group has been to do everything possible to force 
the UFO issue into the presidential campaign by getting moderators or any of the press uh, at these debates to ask candidates about this issue under the assumption that the presence of extraterrestrials engaged in the planet is an issue of some importance. And a lot of, I won't bore your audience with all the effort that's been, been put into this, but it's been considerable. Uh, so, okay, so I guess you could say a lot of kindling was put out there and a lot of awareness was, was, uh, was, was created amongst the, the media. And, but the trigger came when, uh, when uh, uh, Shirley MacLaine uh, published her book, Saging While Aging, and which she opened up the issue of the sighting that Kucinich had in 82 when he was staying at her house. Let me, let me point out, by the way, that Shirley MacLaine knows a lot more and has a lot more to say on the subject than she has ever revealed publicly. She is very well connected politically. She has spent a lot of time talking to political people. She has talked to UFOs with them much. She has not talked about that. She's talked extensively with Kucinich about UFOs. And so when she puts that out there, it, it's enough to raise the bar, right, get above the threshold, and triggers the question from Russell, who made it quite clear that this was a serious question that he put to Kucinich. Then he tossed it to Obama, who sort of slid by it. Then afterwards, after the debate, this was October 30, Chris Matthews then asked Bill Richardson about the Roswell thing, because Richardson was on the, on the record because of the foreword that he wrote in um, the Roswell Big Diaries, which I can read to your audience if you want me to do that. Um, Richardson was a little more, uh, uh, Matthews was a little more flippant. Richardson had some struggle with the question, but ultimately he stuck with his fundamental statement in the diary that the Roswell thing needs to be explained. The, all of this got a great deal of press. And those articles, most of those articles are logged on my website in the media archive section, which now is over, 19, I think, 1,800 articles that are locked in there, mainstream articles on this issue. And things were in play. Uh, a question was asked of Giuliani. A question was asked of Romney at another location. Uh, so the basis for possibly seeing more of this was laid. But the one person that didn't get asked a question was Hillary Clinton. And that's inevitable. It's coming. And she knows it. And the reason that she's going to get asked some questions is because she and her husband are tied to this issue significantly due to the Rockefeller Initiative mm -hmm. in 93 to 95. Uh, in my website, there's a whole section on the Rockefeller Initiative, which is designed to sort of put it in context for any press that want to go there. All of this is based on the work of Grant Cameron, my colleague who is the chief archivist of the of the the interaction between the president of the United States and this subject matter going all the way back to Truman and of course he has a website presidentialufo.com and so we're kind of working together along with other people to keep pushing this thing out there and it's I think very likely and almost inevitable that Hillary Clinton is going to be asked about this, and she has a real problem because we know much too much about it. We have a thousand pages of FOI uh, obtained documents confirming the initiative, including a mention of her in one of these letters that she received some of the material. We have proof that she visited with Rockefeller at his ranch. We have proof that Rockefeller uh, visited Clinton at the Oval Office. We have news news articles. If she's going to try to make light of this or tap dance around it, she is going to have a problem. And so this is on the agenda. This is and there's stuff going on every day to make this happen. Trust me, this is like number one project for me and PRG. Now, what Clinton did here is he's trying to build a firewall to set kind of a backfire in a way, clear a little space to maybe give her some room. And Bill is a very smart fellow. So when he says, back in 19, actually it was 1997, when the, when the, when the anniversary occurred, that I got all the rock, uh, government documents and read them regarding Roswell, that is absolutely preposterous. He could no more have gotten those documents than flown. I can tell you the military and intelligence uh, community and during his administration wouldn't have, wouldn't have validated his parking ticket, let alone provide him those documents. That didn't happen. That's simply not true. Uh, he is known to do that. He is a very smart guy. He knows exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's trying to put a little cover behind her, but it's not going to work. It bothers me, but I understand it. Look, in our in our system now, winning is everything, and and the way it is now in politics, whether you're running for the presidency or the vice presidency or running for the running for the Congress, the standard is this: you will do anything to win, you will say anything to win, and this is one of the reasons our country is in a lot of trouble. We need to get away from that. So, but I understand that's the way it is. 
but it's not going to work, all right? He needs to know, and she needs to know, that too many press are getting very close to asking her those questions, and she'd better have some damn good answers, because if she doesn't, we're going to be right on top of her with the documents, with firsthand witnesses. Plenty of people are still alive that were involved in the Rockefeller Initiative that can be interviewed. There are people involved in the, in the Carter situation, which, by the way, forgive me for running on here, George, but the fact is there is a significant connection between Barack Obama and the UFO issue. Were you aware of that? How so? Aha. Uh-huh. Well, it goes like this. And you've had people on your show talking about this, particularly Danny Sheehan and Alfred Weber. Jimmy Carter raised the UFO issue. He right. came to Washington and campaigned to be president from a very naive posture. Bless his heart. He, he was the outsider, right? He really was the outsider. Very naive about the way Washington works and what goes on here. And so he didn't think it was that big a deal to mention the UFO issue during his campaign, which triggered thousands of letters. And when he got into office, he actually tried to follow up on his campaign promise. Imagine that. And so he, he, he initiated a, a study of extraterrestrial intelligence from the White House, and then accepted, signed off on, his administration signed off on, another study that was brought to his door by Alfred Weber out of Stanford Research Institute. Now, the powers that be were not going to have any thing to do with that. And so those studies were very quickly shut down. The SRI study, since it was outside coming in, was shut down summarily by the Department of Defense. Uh, Alfred Weber can tell you all about that. He was there in the room when the guy walked in and said, you're done, you're finished, that's it. He, he, he resisted that, which resulted in him undergoing some pretty difficult times. The study that was done from within the White House, he couldn't just summarily shut that down. Nobody would deal with it, nobody would help it, but essentially they sort of played it out and then Marsha Smith, who's still alive, very nice lady, wonderful person, sort of wrapped it up with a, not a whitewash, but a, a closing book, called, a closing report that ended up being a book called The UFO Enigma. Not a bad book. I mean, it has not a bad report. It has some good stuff in it. But it was essentially, okay, let's just get this done, get this out of the way. because we, you know. and, then, and then Carter basically shut up on the issue and has never talked about it since except to mention his sighting. Will not talk about it. Right? This is a pretty courageous guy. Will not talk about it. Now, why is this significant? Well, for this reason, the national security advisor from the beginning for President Carter was a big new Brzezinski, a heavy hitter. He was his Kissinger. And I can assure you that there is no – it's inconceivable that Brzezinski was not fully aware of Carter's campaigning on the UFO issue, mentioning it, bringing it up. He was fully aware of the letters that come in. He was fully aware of the two studies that were initiated. No way those studies get initiated without the National Security Advisor knowing about it and fully aware that they were shut down. All right? Now, guess what? It's 30 years later. Right. And the now front runner for the Democratic nomination is Barack Obama. And his chief national security advisor is a big new Brzezinski. Huh. And so Mr. Brzezinski, if he wants, could provide this information to Mr. Obama, Senator Obama, anytime he wants to. Furthermore, Brzezinski is a very heavy hitter with big-time connections in the military and the intelligence community. And I can assure you that he has more than the means to have been briefed privately off the record by any number of people in government. So he, could, he should have a fairly good idea of the situation regarding the ET presence, which means that he could provide that to his candidate who wants to be the president. Will he do so? Who knows? But whatever, he is his national security advisor. So the question that should be put to um, uh, Senator Obama is, are you aware of the, uh, the, the Carter's attempt to, to look into this issue? Were you aware that Brzezinski was his national security advisor? What does he think about that? Has he talked to you about that? And then they should ask Brzezinski, well, what do you know about that period? What did you think about that effort by Carter? Do you think those things should have been shut down? Do you know who Chani Sheehan is? Have you met Alfred Weber? Now, these are, these are perfectly legitimate questions that, of course, the press are very reluctant to ask because they're still living in the embargo. But right now we have two people who probably – it's probably 95 percent or higher – that one of those people is going to be the president of this country with a nuclear football trigger to 10,000 nuclear weapons. And they're going to control and lead the most powerful nation in the world. And the issue is, are we going to ask them about this question, or are we going to let them slide into the office and skirt around it again as we have in all past elections? I think those times are gone. And while I appreciate President Clinton's uh, effort to protect his wife's flank on this issue, on the Bubba show, It's not going to happen. She's going to get asked this question. It's only a matter of time.
And I hope that your audience will be very, very discerning in listening to her answer and responding if they're not pleased with that response, with her answer. We're going to have to see how she answers it. She can't skate, can she? I don't see how. I mean, if you if you look what we have, you have the material. We've got the documents. If she tries to blow this off, it's not going to fly. And so I think we may see this issue in play in a significant way for the first time ever, beyond even what happened in the Carter campaign. Uh, and that could be quite significant, George. It may lead to something, a major breakthrough. How did everything go with the National Press Club? Uh, well, that wasn't my event. I mean, I, oh, I had I was Jimmy's. nothing to do with that, but I'm certainly aware of it, and it's very important. James Fox uh, produced, and of course, with the assistance of the Coalition of Freedom Information, Leslie Kane, did something very significant there. Um, and uh, as you know, they, uh, um, they brought in uh, a number of very important witnesses, many of which were pilots, uh, a number of which were from foreign countries. And they had uh, a substantial press. Uh, presence and got a considerable amount of coverage. It faded away. It lasted about two news cycles, which is, of course, ridiculous because we're talking about some. We're talking about captains, uh, airline pilots, um, uh, the founder of the Peruvian Air Force. Uh, heavy hitters. Heavy, heavy hitters. And they're making the usual profound statements about this flying off of the cockpits of airplanes and the usual things, which is inexplicable. Uh, but th- th- what happened there, though, it's important for, for a number of reasons. One, what they did was, one of the things they did was to finally pick up the mantle that Stephen Greer had laid down in 2001 with his press conference, the May 9th, 2001 press conference, which did, uh, I think, an important service. It, it did generate a lot of press and I think would have gone much further if the the 911 events hadn't taken place. Uh, and so they have brought that back. I think they did a very, they, they may have done an even better job. Very tight, very solid, very strong witnesses, a lot of press coverage. They, it, it was wonderful. So they brought the witness issue back into play, and it's going to make it easier for more people to come forward. That's the first thing. Second thing is there was a tremendous concentration on pilots here, which is, I think, they're some of the strongest witnesses going. At the last X conference in 2007, I had a pilot's panel, and we had, um, uh, or was it 2005? I think it was 2005. No, 2007. No, 2005. We had pilot's <laughs> panel, which is, which is you know, uh, it, it was a very powerful presentation. People liked it very much. Uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, as I've said in your show a couple of times, I believe the single most powerful piece of evidence, you know, sort of a piece, I guess you could say, uh, of evidence out there is the pilot's database that was initially started, and developed by uh, Dr. Richard Haynes, formerly of, of NASA, uh, and now resides with NARCAP, right? Um, the, uh, uh, I'm going to get that. I want to make sure I've got that right for your audience. Uh, it's National Aviation Reporting Center of Anomalous Phenomena. Well over 3,500, maybe approaching 5,000 pilot reports. This is one of the most powerful pieces of evidence because the, 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 the totality of those reports by, by pilots who are, who are skilled individuals, both military and civilian, is overwhelming. So they have brought the pilot thing back into play. Um, so, and then, more importantly, uh, they were able to, uh, because of a great relationship developing between James Fox and Larry King, they were able to do a full Larry King show uh, just a few days before that event. Right. They've done another and, one. And he had just been on with me a few months before that on That's the Larry right. King show. He's done five shows. In yeah. the last, and Larry it's, it's is amazing. Yeah. So, so they are. They have cut. They have made some great progress. They have done great work here. Uh, Coalition of Freedom of Information is starting to really, uh, uh, you know, uh, get into it. They they they've had some success with the NASA court case, getting a ruling out of the Ninth District, I think, indicating NASA has got to search its records. So, uh, Coalition of Freedom of Information is a powerful force now. And by the way, they're pre- they're they're. Their, their, their PR firm is, is Podesta Mattoon, which is Anthony Podesta, which is the brother of John Podesta, who has been publicly out on this issue since 2002. So here we are. We're going to elect a new president. Everybody thinks it's one of the most important elections in history. We've got all kinds of huge, major problems facing us, right, including an extraterrestrial presence, which has been around for a very long time. And the, the cover-up and the truth embargo is a significant issue. There is potentially major technology buried in government facilities, which we cannot get to, which could affect everything. And are the American people going to allow us to go through a whole other election cycle and not see these people who want to run this country at least answer reasonable questions about this? 
it's just it's just no longer uh, an acceptable thing. I mean, look, if the if the candidates want to say, look, uh, I, I I think there's nothing to this. I have looked at the evidence. There's nothing to this. Then let them do so, and we'll and we'll assess their response. Or if 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 they want to say it's not important, it, 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 there may be their CTs, maybe they're not, but it's not important. If they're here, who cares? Right? They can say that, and the American people can assess that. Or they may, they, they may say, well, look, there may very well be something to this, and I will look into it, or it definitely need, needs further study, and we can assess that. But to say nothing, because nobody will ask them anything, to be able to just remain silent, right, which is to get, to get away with having no position on this, is, is simply an affront to the collective intelligence of the American people and an extremely dangerous precedent because, in, in, because they are able to do it with this issue. They, they do it with any issue you'll give them the, 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 the last attitude on. They will, they'll play don't ask, don't tell with any issue if it makes their life easier and allows them to, to run for office without having to, you know, come up with difficult answers to difficult positions. i, I got to tell you, Stephen, with you and uh, Jacques Vallée and what I consider to be the heavy hitters in the UFO field, I mean, uh, just remarkable information. We've got another hour to go with you. We'll open up the phone lines, and I want you to tell us about X-Conference 2008 when we come back. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. Okay, we'll take disclosure questions with Stephen Bassett. Get your take on What's going on? And by the way, if there are any uh, pilots out there that have seen strange things, why don't you check in with us as well? We'll be back in a moment. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Stephen Bassett, our guest. And, of course, we'll take your phone calls. Now, tell me about the X-Conference 2008, the one uh, I'm going to be at. Well, yes, you are. Um, it's April 18, 1920, uh, just outside Washington at the Gaithersburg Hilton. It's our fourth X-Conference. And all these conferences are a direct part of the advocacy work of PRG. That's their primary purpose, is to help to drive the disclosure process. We invite all the members of Congress, their staff, all the presidential candidates got invites a long time ago. Uh, so when you come there, you're actually becoming part of the disclosure process in a way. But to give you a sense of just what this conference is about, this is really, I think, an extraordinary uh, lineup. On Saturday night, the banquet, we have three keynotes. The main keynote will be by Dr. Edgar Mitchell a great American, uh, and obviously one of the astronauts that uh, uh, walked on the moon, Apollo 14. And he is the, the most outspoken living astronaut on this subject matter. And then a, a short keynote will be given by former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada and uh, also Minister of Defense of Canada, Paul Hellyer. Mm -hmm. And then another short keynote by yours truly. Um, I can, I'm pretty sure that Three such individuals have never appeared uh, at, at, as keynoters at any banquet in this genre ever. Uh, it's testimony to just how far this thing has gone and how significant it is when you have one of the most famous and accomplished politicians in a major country, an astronaut, one of the few people to ever set foot off the planet, the, cramp, the best of the best of the best, and uh, in a great man in many other respects, and and the number one talk show host, late night talk show host in America, presenting at a banquet for a conference dedicated to bringing the truth out. Who will that be? Oh, all me, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. and that will be you. But you're 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 doing more than that. You are going to be doing a special two hour presentation. You're putting Saturday. me to work. Yeah, you're going to be working hard from two to four um, in the main ballroom, where you're going to get a chance to meet with your. Tens of thousands of fans, or millions of fans on the on the East Coast that rarely get a chance to see you. That's true. So hard to fly east with those dreaded time zones. And you're going to talk. You're going to take autographs. You're going to answer lots and lots of questions. And uh, I really appreciate your coming out to do the George. It's wonderful uh, to have you. And I know uh, a lot of people are going to be thrilled to be able to get up there and, and meet you. I'm Dadley for the first time. So we're excited about that. And uh, that will be a separate ticketed uh, event. Uh, and for that reason, it's 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 essentially a fundraiser for uh, for the work of Paradigm Research Group. Excellent. And uh, what can I say? So, and then for the for the rest of the picture, I mean, we have seven PhDs, one MD, two astronauts, which includes Brian O'Leary, the I think the world's leading crop circle researcher, Colin Andrews. We have the most important living Roswell witness, as far as I'm concerned, Dr. Jesse Marcel. Oh, that's great. Yeah. We have, great of course, Grant Cameron, who is the you know the man behind the presidential UFO site mm -hmm. and the work uh, that's helping to drive uh, the, this political issue. Uh, 
Uh, we've got uh, three of the legendary aviary, aviary. Uh, Dr. Bruce McAbee, Dr. C.B. Scott Jones, and Dr. John Alexander. Dr. Al- you know, John Alexander is one of the most inside people from within government regarding UFOs, remote viewing, and psychic phenomena. He has an amazing career, uh, which is not fully known. Uh, but I think he's going to be covering some new ground. We have, the, the I think, the, the most knowledgeable person on alternative and alleged ET-derived technology, though it's not alleged for me, Dr. Thomas Vallone. Um, we've got um, uh, Mike Bird and Victor Vigiani coming down to talk about all the exopolitics stuff in Canada. Richard Dolan, of course, I think one of the absolute key figures, the sort of resident historian of this field and television star, I should say, will be there. Um, and then, of course, uh, co-hosting with me again is former CNN anchor Cheryl Jones. Oh, that's great. So uh, it's a, just an amazing uh, lineup. Uh, we give all the speakers a tremendous opportunity to interact with uh, not only each other, but with all of the attendees. Uh, we will have the bank going on Saturday, cocktail party on Friday. Uh, and uh, then, as before, we will have a press conference that everyone is welcome to attend at the National Press Club the Monday following the event, uh, probably at 10 a.m. More information on that soon. So that's X Conference 2008, and I sure hope uh, as many of your listeners can join us as possible to send a message to the Washington power structure that we're not going to go away uh, until this issue is resolved with, at minimum, a disclosure event acknowledging the ET presence, and then we can all decide where we want to go from there. Great. And we will be talking more and more about that as we get close to that date, Stephen. Great. Let's go to the phones. We'll go to our first-time caller line. You're on the air with us. Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm calling from Winona, Minnesota. Okay. My name's Earl. Hey, Earl. Thanks. Hey. hey, thanks for taking my call. Thanks, you guys, for all you're doing. And uh, I just have a have a question. i got a, a preface with a quick question is, have you ever heard of the Eight Veils? Uh, no. Okay. It's just levels of consciousness and, and and activities that people see. And I'm just wondering, with all the with all the activities, the UFOs and, and the aliens, whatnot, if it would tie in with, with uh, you know, demonic activity. Let me, let me put it this way. Everybody, not everybody's a quantum physicist or a philosopher. We all have our, our backgrounds, our belief systems. And all of us are going to have to deal with this issue. And everyone's approaching it from their, what they know, what they're comfortable with. And for many people, they, they, they view some of this phenomena, it's comfortable for them to look at it in religious terms. And, of course, there's more than one kind of religion. And so some may look at it as angels, some as demons, some as something else. Um, that's that's part, of the, part of the process, and that's okay. That's perfectly okay. People have to get some sense of it to, to, to address it, and over time, things will narrow. The focus will narrow. We'll get a better understanding. But for now, those that that see it that way, that's good. That's fine with me. And uh, I'm I'm happy to talk to them in that sense. But I see it from another perspective, pretty much a a, a nuts and bolts, Occam's razor, grassroots kind of thing. We got a planet. They got a planet. We want to fly around space. They already know how to fly around space. If we could visit them, we would. We can't. They can visit us. They have. So I keep it pretty simple. But that doesn't mean it is simple. And then there's also the possibility we are we are becoming more aware as we have advanced as a culture and a civilization whatever, of a whole range of things, and we may be picking up a lot of stuff. Uh, we may not be dealing with just ETs. We may be dealing with a lot of things, and hopefully that will shake out over time. So that's that's how I kind of view it. But do I know for sure they are? No, I do not. Uh, but I respect everybody's attempt to try to assess and understand this issue. Great. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Wild Card Line John, you're on Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hi, George. Hey. I was in the Navy, George, when you and I were in at the same time. Uh-huh. I knew Navy DC-9s from 1973 when the first ones come off the assembly sure. line with Donald Douglas. And um, I think I've seen you at the Navy side of Andrews Air Force Base. Yep. The um, thing that I wanted to mention to your guests that uh, before I asked them the question that I have a problem with is... The of all the UFO guests you've ever had on, George, and, um, and all the years I flew, I flew out of Norfolk, Virginia, one day up to Thule, Greenland, at the top of the world. Left Thule, Greenland, crossed Greenland, went into Keflavik, Iceland, and down into Prestwick, Scotland. And while I was up there, I seen many 
strange things, especially at nighttime uh, at the top of the world. And I watch what was going on. But then again, a reasoning takes place on traveling in space. And why I say that is when I was seeing these objects and I saw them, I always think about us here being the UFOs. And why I say that is uh, I believe that Area 51 is anti-gravity experiments is why we keep everybody away from it. But when I think about somebody coming to Earth from somewhere else, I'll give you a, a good example so you can illustrate it to me what you think, sure. is the planet Alpha Centauri. We believe that there is life there. At light speed, at light speed, or ten times light speed, the distance to travel from Earth to Alpha Centauri, at that speed, it would still take... 600 to 700 years to travel at 10 times the speed of light from Alpha Centauri to Earth. So if we use logic in space travel, that means that they have had to, if there is a, uh, another culture coming to visit us from space, they have to had conquered time and space both to space travel which they would never relay to us because they would leap us forward so drastically that they would destroy us. So they have to be careful with us. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know if your guest has thought about these massive distances that even at light speed you would travel, it would take forever to do, that somebody sure. would convey to people like us that are still absolutely amoebas, because it still takes us 225 days one way to get from here to Mars in our current setup, the way we fly and still shoot rockets out of the atmosphere. Yeah, let me respond. You have people traveling at light speed. Okay, go ahead, Stephen, and thanks well, for the question. I have a degree in physics. I sort of fully understand that. Um, I, there's really two things to say about it that, that's relevant. Uh, the first is this. I'm willing to make a bet that the Einsteinian... Um, how would you say Einsteinian mechanics are the quantum relativistic mechanics that we are currently at right now will probably hold up less time, a lot less time, than the Newtonian system held up. The meaning before that amount of period has passed, we will already transcended it. Uh, we're 104 years from uh, flight, uh, not that much longer from horse and buggies, and we're at quantum mechanics. I can assure you, in, in, in not that long a time, we're already going to be by it. Which is to say that they, they have different physics. They, 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 have a, a, they have different capabilities. They have discovered things about the universe that provide other options. Uh, that's the first point. And that, that's just that, that common sense. Uh, we've gone from where we have to where we are now. Add another couple of hundred years. Add 10,000 if you want. Lord knows what we'll be. Well, that's where they are. And the second point is this. It doesn't really matter. I don't care how they've gotten here. I don't care if they got here by warp, warp drive, dog sled, or the crosstown bus. What's important is they're here. The evidence for them is overwhelming. Without getting into faster-than-light drive, they're here. They've been seen. They've been photographed. We've had tens of thousands of witness reports. We've got insider uh, witnesses coming out from government that have uh, you know much more detailed information. So it, that, it's kind of a moot point how they got here, though I'd love to know how. And so that's my answer to that. Okay, let's go next to our wild card line. You're on the air with us. Hello there, Tom. This is Tom. I'm glad to talk to you, with George, finally, and Thank you, to uh, Steve Barrett okay. uh, Bassett. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. I have uh, been with the Air Force for 31 years as an officer and civilian. I also can take you to the table in the propulsion lab in the basement at the south end of the building where the three grays were laid. Oh, my. were dead. The fourth one was alive. So what base was this? This is 47. I mean, but what base? Where, 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 where are we referring to? You know, we're right field. I'm calling. Oh, right, Patterson. Ohio, okay, gotcha. Right, just north of right field. Gotcha. It's uh, from a town called Piqua. Piqua is a Shawnee Indian name for a powwow. But in any case, my purpose in calling you was to assure you there were three grays that were dead, but after two or three days, they got the smell so bad in the building that they had to go out to Fairborn and to Beaver Creek and buy some children's caskets 
and move them out of the building because it got pretty bad. Now you first but the one that was alive was under the supervision of the Air Medical Laboratory, mm -hmm. and he was taken over to the base hospital. And if you went in the front door and walked about 60 feet and made a sharp left turn, they had him back in there on an IV. Now, they could not communicate with him because they didn't come speaking English or anything. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So they had to do it by mental telepathy, and they found two people in the Air Force that could do this. And they actually got in there and did communicate with him, and he said we had a collision or something. And then he thanked him for taking care of him, and he said he knew that they were trying to help him. And uh, they went on to some other deep parts of the conversation, but I'm not privileged to those. Were you, are you, are you, you're not a first-hand witness to this. Are you, is it someone, someone from inside tell you this? Well, let me say this to you. Yeah. If Art Bell walked in and told you something, would you believe him? Sure. Yes. And these people and I, for example, the chief of staff of the Air Force went to my retirement luncheon. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm retired out of the Pentagon, okay. and I can tell you I'm a war college graduate, etc. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I can tell you these things are fact. And yes, I do know where Blue Book was. It was in the basement of 262 near the freight elevator in the mm -hmm. low rent district. Well, let me, let me, sir. Let me invite you to, uh, uh, if you, if you're interested, contact me at uh, my at PRG at Paradigm Research Group or go to my website. I got the email there. If you want to to bring more of this out, if you want to go more public with this, well, you I could, could be uh, part of the Witness Emergence Program. The UFO itself that was fairly intact. Now, the one was destroyed in the collision, but it ended up down at Langley at NACA. Tom, I was, I've always been uh, perplexed why their others didn't come and get them. Did, did, did that ever come up? Well, I can only tell you today that there are some at Area 51. Now, that has about six stories underground. And they are working somehow with these aliens at that facility at Grown Light. So you think they're still down there somewhere? Uh, yes, I do. I think uh, even one of our presidents has had some conversations with them. He'd be worth talking to, Stephen. What, what, but what I can tell you this. Tired, Go ahead, Tom. Uh, Steve knows what he's talking about. I've listened to enough of what he's had to say tonight that it caused me to call in. But well, again, I appreciate you doing that. What rank did you retire at? Well, I was a civilian at the time I retired. I was a GS-14. I have been a lieutenant colonel and so on. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I really appreciate your calling in uh, every time. I, I never encourage anybody within government or military to break any oaths or violate any laws. But those who come forward, for whatever reason, I mean, I have great respect for. It, it is this process of individuals who are saying, hey, look, I think I want to talk about this. I know this. I'll speak out. It's really driving the political process, and we'll, I believe it's the witness emergence that will ultimately guarantee that we will get a disclosure event and be able to go on from there. And uh, uh, all of those that have done that uh, just have Can I tell you one other admiration. one real short? Yeah, go ahead, sure. Tom. Please. Dr. Von Ohain was introduced to me, and I was introduced to him, I should say, in the 1950s. He was one of these Werner Von Braun types. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember, in the 1950s, we didn't know a whole lot yet. But I can tell you that I spotted him later outside of one of the hangars there at Wright Field, and I ran up to him, and I said, Doctor, can I ask you a question? And he kind of stopped and glared at me, and I said, do you really feel there's life out there in space? And he says, Fasa, are you a snob? And I was kind of stunned by his reply, and he took a couple of more steps, and he glared at me some more. And he said, there are millions of planets out there. And he said, you think yours is the only one that's any good? <laughs> you must be a snob in the way he went. <laughs> Now, uh, Tom, I encourage you to, if you haven't done so already, uh, to 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 write down as much of what you've been told and recall uh, as you can, uh, 
And I know that that could be uh, helpful information at some point. Stay with us. We'll be back with final questions with Stephen Bassett on Coast to Coast AM. Well, what a week of programs, and it's only Tuesday. Well, on Wednesday, Christian Wilde joins us. We talk about some incredible health breakthroughs. I'm going to post on the website tomorrow night, by the way, the regimen of cleaning out the old arteries. I know a lot of you have been asking me for the last several months, and tomorrow's the day that we'll put it all up there for you to take a look at. We'll be back. Jacques Vallée was talking about the video explosion on the Internet with UFOs. Uh, He's not too happy about that because he thinks there's a lot of fraud and deceit out there. What's your take on that, Stephen? Um, very different. Um, the, the the video revolution is really going to change a lot of things. It's it's very very important. Uh, it it allows us now to archive immediately uh, conference videos, things that happen, like Larry King shows and so forth. Your show archived, it was audio and video, both, all on the net there forever so when things are happening it doesn't disappear and fade back into history and witness testimony and uh... presentations uh... as well as plenty of video uh... is out there and i think jacques of course is from another generation i think what he maybe is not up on is that the internet is an incredibly increasingly self-regulating peer-reviewed operation where you can put something up but 50 million people take a look at it and pick it to pieces. Hmm. So you can play games if you want, but our the ability for the net to sort of shake out the stuff that's not that's not kosher is really increasing all the time. And so, you, in fact, it's going the other direction. You're going to see higher quality stuff. You're going to see more of it, and it's going to be much more difficult for the powers that be to how would you say uh, just kind of play with us and hope that we'll just forget. So the internet internet revolution, this video part, is going to play a major portion in breaking this truth embargo. Okay. George, is there one other thing I'd like to say? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, and this is kind of important. Every time I hear a, a, a person, another person who has been in the military or been in the agency, particularly that have retired or whatever, and they go way back, every time I hear another one tell their story for the first time, to me at least, about what they saw, did, heard, and it's like I get chills. It's, it's very touching because these people are living history, literally, and uh, and there are thousands of them, believe me, thousands of them that have never come forward and probably never will. And I'd just like to say to them, for any that are listening, even if you never intend to speak about what you saw, heard, did, uh, whether it be firsthand, secondhand, while you worked inside government, going back all the way to the 40s for many of you, consider at least writing as much down as possible and then having – one of your heirs make it available or public after you pass because we're talking about the history here of a 60-year period that's the most profound stretch of history in human uh, in human time on this planet it's the history of this transition where we go from a a a world that the idea of being you know part of a, a a galactic civilization is simply ridiculous to virtually on the verge uh, of learning about that uh, the reality and the history is kind of buried because of the embargo and the cold war and everything else but it still resides with those people and so i hope we we learn as much as we can from them. okay final calls here we go first time caller line mike you're on the air with us hi there how you doing good michael Calling from uh, Arkansas. Okay, sir. There's a lot I'd like to say, but I'm kind of scared to. I'm I, I, a lot of props to that last call. There was in the Air Force and called. Mm, okay. And uh, I'll just say I knew a man that was in communications in the Air Force during Vietnam, but I don't want to get into all that. But uh, I lived in Nevada when I was a kid from the time I was seven to seventeen. And I've seen a lot of different stuff in the skies in Nevada over the mountains. And as far as these, like these big ships that are, that they just spotted over Texas, this has been going on for 25 years because, or 26 years, because I remember when I was 13 or 14 years old and we seen something in the sky and it looked like it was just floating and it was long black and the only way i remember describing it was it was the length of several football fields mm-hmm. and uh there was a bunch of us playing ditch them a little game we had and uh, but anyways we all ended up at the 
at the uh, service road of the highway looking up in the sky. Well, we went home that night, and uh, I called the Air Force Base and asked them if they had found it, you know, had seen anything on their radar. At, you know, at 14 years old, and they told me that, you know, I explained what I seen and everything. They told me it was probably a, a weather balloon. Didn't know what a weather balloon was, but I knew what I seen was not a weather balloon. Sure. And uh, I've seen lights. I've watched uh, different shows on History Channel, uh, lights they've seen in Mexico during the middle of the day, little silver lights that dance in the air and everything. And uh, I've seen them as a kid. Uh, as far as Area 51, I remember being in high school as a kid, and about once a month, probably my sophomore or junior year, the whole ground would just tremble. And it was like, well, they've done tested another bomb at the, at the test site. And, uh, but as, I mean, what I seen that night, it was, it was very long. It looked like it was floating. And there was like, Three red lights underneath it, and then a white light up from that, and a couple blue lights. And but it looked like it was floating. But as quick as you seen it, it was just gone. Well, you're not alone. Fifteen uh, percent of the American people now stayed in polls that they've they've had a sighting, which means not you know something significant. Uh, and that's that's nearly uh, got kind of forty five million adults. Uh, so, and that's just in America, and we're we're only five percent of the world's population. The number of sightings that have taken place is in the millions. So we've had plenty of sightings, uh, and we've got photographs, and we've got the videotape, and now we've got tens of thousands of contact reports, detailed reports, consistent uh, from around the world, accumulating in the files of researchers. So what we need now, my friend, is uh, the government to come out and say, okay, yeah, we got ETs. We can tell you this, can't tell you that, tell you more later, and then we can all sit back and decide what we want to do. And uh, hopefully we can focus our efforts and, 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 and uh, not, not waste time going up blind alleys. But every little sighting has built another little, you know, put another little uh, you know, marble into the, into the ring there. And uh, appreciate your, your talking about yours. You've always believed, Stephen, that government would disclose eventually. Oh, yeah, it has to. It has to. Um, and for for many reasons, and I've I've given extensive lectures on this, but uh, um, it's just there's too many countries, and the ability of the U.S. to control these countries or uh, bribe and influence them is, is dramatically diminishing. They're asserting their hege hegemony. They're starting to clearly demonstrate that they're bringing material out. The U.S. is under pressure from witness testimony. It's under pressure from evidence build up. Uh, plus, the ETs are very very prominent. I mean, they're all over the place, and they're getting very bold. And so the idea that the government continued to say, yeah, there's nothing here, there's nothing here, it's just ridiculous. It's like the emperor, you know, the government is basically saying the emperor is uh, going to buy a new set of clothes. And every year, another couple of million people look up and see they got a naked emperor walking around here. And so it, at some point, it's just absurd. And the government really can't afford to, to, to be viewed as absurd. Uh, and our trust levels, you know, the CNN, recent CNN poll hit an all-time low. For CNN, uh, the president scored at 30 percent, which is the lowest for CNN. I think other polls have put him at 22, and the Congress came in at 24 percent. One of the reasons that there's no trust and, and, and these approval ratings are where they are is because people see through this nonsense. They know the government does, it, 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 it is lying about this or is covering this up or whatever you want to call it. And every day that they know that, it irritates them a little bit more. It's not the only thing that irritates them about government's uh, confabulation, but uh, that one in particular, I think, bugs them. And uh, you just – you just can't have that go on. Uh, so it will end. It has to end. Uh, and I think soon. I, I think I've, I've told you, George, and I'll tell you again. Based upon my reading uh, between the lines and 11 years in Washington watching all this, my call is I think the Dems have made a – the Democrats have made a decision on this. Based upon what Richardson's done, Podesta has done, and other things that I'm seeing, I think the Democrats have made a behind-the-scenes th uh, decision they're going to they're going to disclose in uh, in 2009, early in the administration. Once they're in. Once they're in, yeah, and 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 they they would like to not have to deal with it going in 
right? But yeah. there's so much happening, and there's guys like me running around giving them a hard time, and and James Fox and Leslie Kane and Alfred Weber and Sala and you know and Victor and on and on and on and on, and so they can't fully control it, and the media are swinging our way, so you know they're trying to dance their way through this, but you know, don't you hate that? Don't you hate that? When the government comes to you and says, okay, here's yep. the deal. We're going to have this big election. You're going to decide who you want to lead. But, you know, we, we can't talk about this and we can't talk about that. We can't talk about that. But just trust us. Just elect us and, and we'll deal with it. Yeah. Don't you hate that? Yeah, get us in first. Yeah. What's the point of having a freaking uh, constitutional representative republic if, 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 if it's all pigs and pokes? I mean, it, it, you know, talk about it, address every single issue. Tell us what you think and trust us to make the right decision. The American people have gone along with this game. But, you know, and I think the American people are starting to realize, wow, that game's not working for us. Electing pigs and pokes that, that won't really tell us what they really think and can't really address the tough stuff, but we think they'll do it once they're in, it's not working. And so they better start demanding full accountability from their candidates before they get in office, and then they need to demand accountability after they get in. It's not complicated. And until the American people stand up, they have at least a 50% responsibility for whatever happens. Let's go to our West of the Rockies line. You're on Coast to Coast with Stephen Bassett. Hi there. Hey, George. How you doing? Good. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. Uh, well, I actually have a couple of comments. Uh, sure. First, I got a bone to pick with you quickly. Uh, my son called in about two weeks ago. You told me he had a uh, voice for uh, radio, and he's like the second year in his nursing program, so now he's all messed up. He doesn't know what to take. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> And the second is, you know, I drive at night. I deliver propane. And one of the nights I was uh, looking at the stars, as I quite often we do, and I noticed that there was a blinking light that was basically hovering over the uh, horizon, or actually over some trees. And it had this weird, like, humming noise. I mean, it was like a pulsating mm -hmm type noise. And I watched it and for a couple of seconds. And I put my head down, and I looked on the ground to pick up uh, something. I think it was one of the hoses and that. And I looked up, and this thing shot, like, right up in space. And it just stood there, and it blinked on and off, on and off, on and off, like a red and a green and a blue and then a green. But it twinkled like a star, and I just looked at it going, oh, so that's how you guys play the game. You, you sit out there like a star twinkling, and it just faded out. And that's baffled me because I've looked for it countless times but i cannot seem to uh to see it again now i see things you know shoot across the sky or whatever but this is the the weirdest thing and i guess what what got me was the humming noise out of it was like a pulsating thing and i just i don't know if your guest has ever uh, heard anyone talking something like that or what oh i've heard them all but you've, you've made a good observation imagine if you had the ability to park a vehicle up any height pick a height hundred thousand two hundred thousand feet so essentially, it's simply a dot in the sky like a star. And then you could drop it straight down, right? Straight right. down at enormous speed. So it's first is up there, and boom, now it's down there. Do about your business. Bing, bang, boom, bada, bing. And then straight up. Look, you can come, you can go. Nobody's even going to notice. Uh, this, is, this is, I think, very much how they can operate if they want to. Or they can just fly across your visual line of flight if they want to, depending upon how ostentatious they want to be. But, yeah, the ability to park up there, so unless you're an astronomer focusing on that area and you happen to know the exact star formation, you wouldn't notice that little dot. So they come, they go, and they go about their business. And, uh, and there's some evidence as to what that business is. So, yeah, very simple observation. You think that the, the fine uh, geniuses that are – inhabiting our fine colleges and universities would be able to arrive at similar observations, but they seem to be just too busy hanging on to their tenure to open up their minds and uh, consider new ideas. Stephen, where do you think they're coming from? Uh, dimensional, time travelers, other planets? I'm Occam's razor uh, uh, all the way, uh, George. Until I know otherwise, they come from another planet. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's why? the most practical. We don't, need, we don't need other dimensions of the future. we got other planets, so uh, we'll start there. You know, we don't need – I think jumping to these other things kind of muddies the water a little bit, though it's fun. But, you know, when you're trying to politically move this forward, you need to stay as basic as possible. And so I think, you know, your average member of Congress will sort of understand that if we got a planet, they could have a planet. Okay. We got rocket ships. They got better rocket ships. Okay. There you go. You start getting the time travel, and they really start to fade on you. So I have to keep it simple. Well, let's go to our wild card line. Robert, hi there. You're on the air. How you doing? Good. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the uh, USO, which is the submerged objects, um, the fact that the the majority of this planet is water. 
Sure. Uh, it would stand the reason that they could actually go in the depth and, and, and would possibly have bases here on Earth. Sure. So if time travel or if travel through space was that difficult, maybe this is a you know a, a station that they that, that they can stay here for some time or have been here for some time. Some of well, my favorite stories, Stephen, are these submerged cases. Sure, sure. A lot of lot of a uh, lot of sightings of them coming out of the water. If they have the ability to go in the water and, and maneuver, then again, it gives them enormous cloaking ability uh, to some degree. And as far as them being in the water, the only people going to be able to detect them are the military, right? And most civilians don't have, you know, deep-ranging sonar. You know, I mean, you, I don't think you can get it at Radio Shack, at least not now. And so the military is not going to tell us, so they may pick them up, but they're not going to reveal that. So overall, they have a lot of ability there. Whether they have bases underwater, who knows? They, they're seen going into mountains. This is important to note, and, and for this reason. I think it's fair to say if they can travel vast distances in short amounts of time, bend space, bend time, whatever, their ability to sort of cloak themselves or at least be discreet probably is pretty advanced too. Uh, as we, as I point about, we pointed out, coming straight down from a point in the sky, using using the waters as as a way to get away or, or cloak themselves. So when they appear, when they when they when they appear in vast fleets over Mexico, you know, or 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 some of the some of the really extraordinary sightings that we've seen, when they do that, the first question you need to ask is why. Why so ostentatious? Is it simply a cavalier, I could care less whether you see us or not, or is there a reason for it? And I believe the reason, and I'm speculating here, is that they are literally driving the terrestrial awareness and disclosure process down here, driving it by stimulating it, by keeping it in play. Uh, and why they're doing that, again, I speculate, is because they want us to disclose. They want this thing to sort of come to a head, disclose, get that over with, you know, and then we'll all go watch 10,000 documentaries, and when we're sick to death of hearing about the ETs, they'll finally show up, and we'll all party. I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, a scenario that one could argue with, but I have never heard a better one that it sort of explains what's going on in that regard. So, yeah, uh, underwater, definitely, and it's a, it's a developing range, a developing field of study, as is underground bases. Well, Stephen, one more time, give us some information. Where do people go to uh, sign up for the X conference? Oh, yeah, full registration and info is at x conference.com, x conference.com. Uh, they can register there. Um, and they can also, uh, if they can't, if they have no internet access, they can call PRG's number for a form to be sent to them 202 215. Eight three four four two zero two two one five eight three four four. The main site is paradigmresearchgroup.org, and the the email address is prg at paradigmresearchgroup.org. And there's tons of stuff at that site. The main site, particularly, including a massive video archive, a massive uh, news archive, two eighteen hundred articles, a huge quotes directory, a bibliography. And a lot of good stuff. I love it. Stephen, thanks a lot, and I'll see you in April, my friend. Yes, indeed. For Steve Carr, Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladisur, sorry, Sean, Ross Mitchell, Ian Punnett, and Art Bell. I'm George Norrie. Somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM, we'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.